Hi guys, today we're going to talk about what to put in your IBESS lab reports. Um, this is just a reference guide to commonly asked questions. Um, hopefully you'll understand kind of main parts to your lab and um, how to use the rubric that I've given you, which is how you're graded, and also has really good insight if you read it carefully into what you should be improving on. And then some common tips, especially error and limitations. You should have with you um, a, a paper copy of the rubric because you're gonna you can also go to the yeast lab example online so my suggestion is to after you're done listening go to the yeast lab example that's linked on my website and read that online because it's several pages but use a paper copy of your rubric um, so that you can really mark it up cross it out highlight it really um, engage with the rubric I know it sounds silly but the more familiar you are with that the better you're gonna do a little um, comment here about length of your paper. Um, it's really important, you guys, that um, your paper is not long just to be long, that you have something to say. So really watch length. Make sure that your tables, if you print out your lab, don't run on to multiple pages that they weren't meant to run on to. All of this um, is, you know, can someone pick up your lab and read it uh, without, you know, getting confused. That's the goal in terms of length and presentation. Parts to your lab. So as I go through all of these, it's actually the parts that I would title each section in your lab. Um, and it might be different than you're used to seeing on some of the labs you use in class where you see like, you know, abstract or you see procedure. But if I were you, these numbered sections is what I would title the lab. I'd have a section for background. And I like to put it in the front so that anyone can pick up my lab without, um, you know, a ton of scientific background and get um, the idea of what you're talking about. You should always cite sources unless it's common knowledge, like you would know it sitting around the lunch table, you should have a source for it. This can come from your textbook, but ideally you have primary source, the place that discovered the information. And a source is not Wikipedia. You need to go, that's great background information for you, but in terms of citing a source, you would want to go to the source that's linked on the bottom of the Wikipedia page. Um, second section of your lab would be your method. This is what we think of as a procedure usually, but method is a little bit broader. Um, the first thing your method should state is your question or your hypothesis. Um, you guys may have heard me say that you don't need a hypothesis necessarily in the class if you have a really well-framed question. Um, and that's that comes straight from the IB framework. Um, a good question, a good inquiry question um, can lead to great labs. Second part should be your steps. So this is kind of what we think of formally as the procedure and you can include any necessary diagrams. In environmental science especially it's often very helpful to have a map that you've added arrows or labels to or maybe you've drawn what your quadrant map kind of looked like on your on your site plan you know you took a picture of the site and you drew something in on it um, <clears throat> don't make this this needs to be necessary to understanding the lab but it oftentimes can be very helpful to understanding and can cut down on the amount of words you have to use if you just say C diagram one C figure two then um, the <clears throat> other step of your method um, needs to be an identification of the variables. I suggest making a table and talk about the independent variable, the dependent variable, um, the control and experimental groups, and any and <clears throat> any control variables that you had to hold constant. Um, let's take an example of, uh, you know, your question was you wanted to look at whether or not the color of bird feeder affects if more birds visit the feeder. And you predict that um, brightly colored feeders will be um, visited more often than neutral or, uh, you know, bark feeders. So um, your independent variable is the color of the feeder, your dependent variable is how much seed is missing every day from the um, bird feeder. Well, you're gonna have to hold a lot of variables constant to make sure you're just testing color, right? You're gonna use the same kind of seed in every feeder. You're gonna put it in a similar environment. Uh, what is that environment? Next to a tree, away from a tree? 
um, you're going to want to put it out for the same duration of time and, um, you know, have relatively similarly sized uh, feeders. So all these things that you're going to keep constant, you should have a, a solid handful for every lab that is very specific to your lab. So far you have the background, the method, and the third part is going to be data. You will want a ta an area for tables, and I like to start data collection with this, just data, and you're going to have table one, table two, however many tables you need. A note though, in tables you are always trying to balance showing information on one hand and having it be easy to understand on the other. I see tables every year that I can't read. I literally can't find the information that is trying that is trying to be conveyed. So please, you know, label your tables well and then take a step back from them and say, can someone that doesn't know what I'm talking about read this? Um, leave room in your tables or create a separate table for calculations. Um, you want to do something with your data after you're done and sometimes it's really nice to put that right in your table. For instance, in our example up here, let's say I have 10 red feeders, um, 10 brown feeders, and um, you know, 10 metal feeders. Well, maybe my calculation is I take an average of the 10 you know, brightly colored ones, 10 brown and 10 metal to see how much seed was gone every year or every day. Um, you know, leave room for your calculations. And also, this is a big tip, you have to write out your calculations in an IV lab. So if you're gonna take an average, you have to show, I know it sounds silly, you have to actually show what that means. Um, I would, <clears throat> oh, there's your calculations to show work. I would also think how you want to present your data. So what kind of graph best represents this data? I have links on my website, as does Mr. Rote's website, in terms of what graph uh, best fits your data. You know, going back to this hypothetical example of, you know, do bird feeder uh, colors influence um, how m many birds visit a feeder? Well, um, you know, what's the best data to show that? You know, pie chart, bar graph, scatter plot. You, you have to think through what it is you want to show and that'll tell you, and what your data is that you're collecting, and that'll tell you what your graph is. So we have three sections to our lab, and then you just have one more section, but it's a big in. It's the conclusion. So I really, really suggest you depend on your rubric for this. Um, but, you know, a lot of times I get this great conclusion, but they forgot to kind of tell me the so what. So what of your lab? So what are your data? What are the implications of your results? You always want to start by referencing the data. Maybe it wasn't what you predicted, so you have to say, you know, uh, talk about that a little bit. But always start with your data and then tell me, so what? Well, um, birds visited the brown uh, feeder, you know, 10 times more often than the other two feeders. Well, if you're trying to restore bird habitat, maybe, you know, you could use this in your findings. Or, um, you know, if you're trying to uh, get birds on campus, um, you know, maybe you can use this in your findings. Also, no conclusion is complete without a discussion of the error and limitations in your um in your lab. So every well-designed lab is still going to have a little bit of error and a little bit of limitation. Um, let's take my hypothetical example here. Maybe you know you could only do this during the months of January and February. Well there's a lot of birds that aren't present in our area in January and February so you're only going to get the winter birds. Maybe in your lab um, you know you were limited um, in how many trials you could run and you wanted more trials. Um, there are two types of error that are really important to remember. The first is, um, you know, kind of the precision or instrumental error. Um, and, you know, that's always going to be present. But the second is in the design. You know, what, what could have been designed differently about your method to prevent error? And there needs to be hearty discussion about that. Let's take a look at your rubric. So get this out really quick. And let's take a look at where these four sections of your lab are so you know where to get help when you're completing it. Your background um, is important to the reader, but in terms of the IB rubric, it's um, not super important. And it's just this little section down here. Discussion is clear and well-reasoned, showing an understanding of the context and the results. Okay, So you need to have some kind of prediction of what you are going to find um, 
and you know the background that makes this worthwhile. Let's talk about method. Well, method is a huge part of the IB lab um, in ESS. So the entire first section, planning and method, is um, for the method. And where it sees, says zero, don't focus on that. One and two is where you want to aim. You want to be up here, okay? So first you want to focus problem or question that identifies all the variables. That's where your table comes in handy. Okay. You need to control for all the variables, okay? And so if you control for some, but there's clearly some that um, were missing, then you're going to end up in the one category. For instance, sometimes I just have people, like in that feeder example, set out one red one, one brown one, and one metal one. Well, that's not, you know, enough uh, information. And that gets to the third aspect here, sufficient data. You have to collect a lot of data. You need to have a lot of trials or a lot of repli replicates. And so, you know, in the field, this can be really hard because you have to visit the site and it's really time intensive. So think about that when you're designing your your lab that you can get enough data that you can run calculations. Okay, so pay really close attention to this. Um, let's look at the last piece here. We talked about both of those. Okay, so here's data collection. It's pretty um, extensive. Um, here's your raw data, and this is just that you have. Um, oops, sorry that you have quantitative or numbered data, but that you don't forget your qualitative data. What was the weather like when you were outside looking at your bird feeders? Did that influence the results? And don't forget your units. If you forget your units, you're automatically bumped down into the one category, okay? Um, processing data, what did you do in terms of calculations to um, look at the data or what it means? Also, there's links on my website how to use sig figs if you're not familiar with that and um, you know presenting the data um, oftentimes this is going to be a graph occasionally it could be uh, you know something else like a data table of processed results or something and then we're going to look at conclusions which is this section down here so it's a really important part of your lab and it's these two boxes under evaluation conclusion do you see how weaknesses and limitations is its own category? It's really important, both in practice, like I see human error so many times on people's labs. Yeah, that's expected to be there. There's gonna be a little bit of human or instrumental error and you'll have a margin in that. But what can be done to your method to make it better? And then lastly, like, you know, what does your data say? What's the so what? And you have to use the figures and numbers. Don't just say the data shows. Give me exact figures and important parts from your um, from your from your data and your calculations. Hopefully, this helps you a little bit. I think the next step is for you guys to use the rubric that you've just gone over with me to grade the yeast lab. In class, we'll come back, and the student to um, receive the closest score to what the IB moderator did uh, will get a prize. And here's the thing, you guys, you could do this forever. So I would put a time limit on yourself, maybe set the timer for like 30 minutes and take a look at the lab with 30 minutes with the rubric in front of you. Otherwise, you can go back and, and um, nitpick forever. Good luck, and I'll see you in class.